Yes, welcome to the No Say Project. I'm your host, Mark Stevens, author of Adventures Legoland, and I hope we're coming out over the network, but uh, hopefully everything is good to go. That we got the tech issues finally ironed out, at least for this week. Uh, it is December 21st, 2013, here live from the Fortified Compound in Phoenix, Arizona, where it is a beautiful sunny day. Well, it's partly cloudy today, but it is pretty nice out. And uh, after I had done some time up in Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago, it was really good to get back. It was uh, the high of the day. And I'll talk about this today. Um, zero. Zero and negative one was the high of the day a couple of weeks ago. So uh, kudos to anybody who's living in the Minneapolis area where it gets that cold when the high of the day is, is uh, single digits uh, or zero. That's pretty damn cold. So I do appreciate the uh, the weather that we have here in the valley. Um, but, uh, we'll be taking calls today. Hopefully I, I, we tested that. So we got the call line set up. So if you want to join me here on the big show today, it is 218-632-9399. 218-632-9399. You can also Skype me during the show. So that would be Frank Rizzo 3. That is uh, Frank Rizzo with the number 3. And uh, then I can put you into the No State Project chat. And uh, glad to, uh, and Calvin, if you're, li I know you're listening, if you want to join me on the mumble, it looks like we've got that all squared away. So if you want to jump on board, uh, you just yeah, yeah, feel free to do that at any time. Well, uh, well, uh, yeah, it, it's it's been it's been a few weeks. Uh, we're here live every Saturday, uh, except for the last two Saturdays, uh, here on LRN.FM, and uh, at from four to seven Eastern Standard Time, and one to four Pacific Time. And um, I want to get to uh, something that happened. Well, actually, we got a, a, a first call, so let's do that. But I will be talking about my little adventure in Legal Land, where I had a U.S. attorney. Uh, well, it's a standard tactic that politicians use. They know that if they yell and scream and they make a scene, that even though they're under no threat whatsoever, they know that the police are going to go after us. They're not going to go after uh, the individual making the scene. And so that's what happened. And uh, so I'll talk about that as the show moves on. But let's get to the calls because that's that's kind of what, you know, that's one of the big questions that we have. We know that the co the problem from last week is all right because everybody's hearing me now. But now we're going to go to the caller line and we're going to see if the caller line issue is uh, is fixed. But we've got uh, someone who's calling on Skype. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, Mark, uh, this is Kurt. From hey, Portland. Kurt, my friend Kurt, and I know you're calling from Portland. Yep. What can I do for you today, my friend? Well, first I'd like to uh, mention uh, uh, the book uh, Government Indicted and uh, <clears throat> really getting a lot out of that. I should be probably taking notes. There's so much in this book. I probably should have larger did, margins. Uh, master... Oh, so were you just going to say masterpiece? Yeah, yeah it's a, yeah, I was just going to say you did a masterful job on this because, uh, well, like you mentioned in the book, um, Adventures in Legal Land didn't really accomplish the, the goal of really exposing the fallacy and just the, the contradictions that is government versus – there's definitely no doubt – it, there, there's, you know, leaves no doubt in this book that uh, you're really uh, exposing it, blowing it wide open for the the fallacy, the logical fallacy that it is. I mean, the, you know, one of the points you make in there is, look, uh, the fact that you're forced to fund government, it's pay or go to jail, that alone should be enough to, you know, help anybody to understand that there's no way that government could be there to protect you. I mean, I mean, that's the PR, right? And that government's there to, to protect us. But the fact that you're forced to pay for it, um, that leads and it just in, sets up uh, insurmountable contradiction right there. I, th I think that's one of the things that drives some of us. Uh, I know this, that's probably one of the things that makes Larkin Rose crazy is that it's such a very simple thing to, to demonstrate. And that the compulsory nature of it, right. pay or get shot, which Lysander Spoon had brought up also in No Trees in the Constitutional Authority, that the only government of consent that there has ever been is pay or, or get shot, or at the at the point of a bayonet, he puts he, he puts it. So it, 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 
That's why well, when you bring that up and you have someone that, that, that can't argue with the logic because it's ironclad, the next thing that you have, and we can all predict it, what about the roads? What about yeah. the roads? Yeah. Well, you know, study a little bit of history. We didn't always have the state, and roads were still being built. You know, people got to get from point A to point B. I think a little bit of spontaneous order could make that happen. You know? well, of course, but that 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 is, you know, to me, it's such a it's an indication of somebody who is so resistant to actually thinking, which is why we're in the why we have government right now. Why we still have it is because people are generally. Uh, opposed to the idea of thinking, the, you know, the whole process of thinking is right. not something that they want to engage in, and that's why we we have these things. Well, well, well of course it's compulsory. Uh, you pay or you go to jail. But uh, how would we have the roads, and who would protect us? Well, people, uh, people would protect us. We just wouldn't, uh, we just wouldn't be accepting the uh, the compulsory nature of it. That we would notice that the ones that we need protection from most are those who are claiming to protect us at the barrel of a gun. Do we have JT on? Yeah. Or is that Calvin? Uh, maybe they're muted. I, no, they're <laughs> not muted up. Not I, can hear them. I, I don't know if you can hear that, but uh, I'm, it sounds like there's somebody else on the line now. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I'm glad you got the book. Glad you're enjoying it. Uh, did you? Uh, yeah. Did you have a particular issue? I think I think I know what you're calling about, though. Yeah, I'll go ahead and bring it up. Um, I mean, this is a long. I've had uh, kind of a long, ongoing issue with the IRS, and um, the latest thing is that I got a letter last night. Um, I don't know. It must have come like after six o'clock or some when I was out and about, and uh, it's a notice of. Uh, levy on wages, salary, and other income from my employer. I mean, I didn't even get anything directly about that from the IRS. I got it uh, through my employer, which I think is a little bit odd. I mean, I've dealt with this type of thing before in 2009, and in, it just seems to me that the IRS is inconsistent with their protocol, and uh, I'm a big surprise, I'm sure, but I mean, in in 2009, what happened was um, they sent me, you know, a, a series of uh, certified mail saying basically we're going to steal your money, and then they sent me a, a final notice, and then they um, emptied out my checking account, which I had probably about 900 bucks in there or something. This was back in 2009, and then uh, later, a couple of months later, um, they sent me. Uh, I noticed that they were uh, intending to uh, levy, garnish my wages, essentially. But I got it from them, not my employer. I don't think my employer actually sent me anything back then. So this is kind of a flip. So. Well, what they're supposed to do, if, you know, going back a few years, in 1998, they had what's called the, the, the Restructuring Act. And they had all those hearings uh, for show. No one was convinced that, well, nobody would have a brain in their head. None of us who actually thought and engaged in critical analysis uh, thought for a second that those, you know, well, like, they're any different than any other hearing uh, with, with these people called Congress. And, yeah, they passed their restructuring act. And they're supposed to give you a hearing before they do a levy or, you know, or five days after they've done a lien to give you an opportunity to challenge it. I worked with people for almost 10 years before they even acknowledged we filed a timely request. They always would, that's why I always tell people that request, the 30 day request, always has to go certified registered mail, not certified registered, because they will always say that they didn't get it. Uh, so, anyway, I think what they're doing here is they're trying to do an end run around that and at least get something because yeah. they're supposed to do that 30 day letter. But uh, we'll address that. We're on. Uh, we're up against a okay. break, unfortunately. We'll be back. My name is Mark Stevens. This okay. is the December 21st edition of the No State Project here live at the Fortified Compound. You can see how sunny it is right now here in Phoenix. Um, we'll, uh, we're on LRN.FM. We'll be taking your calls and more at uh, 218-632-9399. 218-632-9399. Don't go away. We'll be back in just a moment. 
Yes, welcome back to the No State Project. I'm Mark Stevens, author of Government Indicted and Adventures in Legal Land, website markstevens.net. Glad to be with you back here on the uh, big show here on LRN.FM. It's December 21st, 2013 on the Liberty Radio Network, live from the Fortified Compound in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, we'll be taking your calls today. We're going to try to get uh, JT connected. It seems like he's got the same tech issue that I had last week, which to this day, we still don't know what it was. It just, it was a problem and it uh, cleared up last week. But if you want to join us, it's 218-632-9399. Hopefully we can get JT on real fast. I uh, want to go back to our calls. We're talking with Kurt in Portland. Kurt, welcome back to the show. Uh, hey, Mark. I think, you know, because you and I have done, an, in fact, we actually have a call of shame where you did the call to the IRS. And so for right. probably the better part of 2013, we've been trying to get some information regarding uh, evidence the Constitution laws apply. And have any of the agents been able to provide that to you or, you know, or to me? No, and as a matter of fact, um, what the callers have not, or the, um, <clears throat> your audience hasn't heard, is that I actually went into the IRS office on uh, the 12th, uh, you know, just a little over a week ago, and um, you know, I spoke with uh, an IRS agent for just a few minutes, I uh, forget his name, but um, he uh, he basically kicked me out of the office because I... I, I don't think I set it up right. I mean, like you said, you know, maybe a question to lead in would have been, would a, uh, l uh, you know, lack of evidence constitute, um, you know, grounds to abate an assessment, something like that. But I just asked him, you know, um, what evidence is there that the U.S. Constitution and IRS code are applicable to me? And he's like, well, I'm not going to answer that question. You know, the courts have ruled such and such and so and so. Uh, but, you know, you almost want to uh, say, well, yeah, uh, that's to be expected because the, the judges are being funded by the proceeds from the theft. So what do you expect? I'm still looking for evidence. Well, but anyways, true. yeah, so it was me. Me and my girlfriend went down there, and, and, and yeah, the guy said, uh, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. So basically, I got thrown out. And it's like, you know, not only do they hang up on us, but they throw us out of their offices for asking a simple question. You know, nice people, huh? Well, yeah. yeah people who, who live by the sword are, are going to be that way. Uh, the thing is, when they, obviously, yeah. when you're asking for evidence the Constitution applies, for them to turn around and say the courts have ruled in this. Now, let's just give them a, let, let's give them a, a, a pass here. Kurt, for just for the sake of argument, let's just say that the courts had ruled against somebody about evidence, the Constitution and, and code applying to them. What does that have to do with you? Right. I thought of that, too. Right. It, it, it's completely irrelevant. Um, it's completely irrelevant. But the uh, the the other thing that not only we ask for evidence and so let's give them a pass and say, well, you know, Mark and Kurt did. That's just a stupid thing to ask. I mean, you're asking for evidence. What, what, what are you trying to accomplish by asking for evidence? What, what, you know. Let's look at it from the standpoint of their how restructuring. About due process? It. I'm sorry? I said, how about due process? That'd be nice. Well, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I'm, the point evidence. I'm trying to make is just, you know, so let's give them a pass on that. That we're just being, we're just being silly by asking for evidence. Okay. Because we know asking for evidence is, is just, that's just not what, you know, people in their right head do. If you look at their own code, and you and I, we've done this. I don't know how many times we've actually done this. But in their own code, the Restructuring Act, Section 3705, does state that when you request the you have an agent assigned with direct personal with direct contact information, they're supposed to do that and provide you the agent with direct contact information so as to resolve a conflict that you may be having. Now, how, now I don't know how many times we let's just say we did it four times. Four times we've requested that. How many times have they actually responded and provided an agent with direct contact information? None. Zero. So this is just another example that even if you follow their code and try to do it the way they lay out in their little sacred writ, they don't – they ignore it. The written law means nothing to them. Yeah. Nothing. The evidence or lack of evidence means nothing to these people. So the reason why you went down there 
uh, to let everyone know, give a little uh, ins- more, a little more insights, is because they have for the past year refused to assign an agent, and we have not been able to get through to anybody responsible on the phone. Yeah. So that's why you went down. So I know you, you're planning. On, I, I know you have a life. You, you, know, you can't just go down to the IRS office every any morning okay. that you feel like, but you are planning on going back down. Well, I, I can. Um, I mean, we're almost at the end of the year, and so I'm going to have a little bit of extra time. You know, I can take a vacation day or a float day or whatever. Um, but, yeah, that's that's possible. I'm just – one of the questions I have is should I go ahead and um, call up my employer and see um, – you know, get any more information from them. I would call them, and I would be happy to join you. I would be happy to join you with that on that call, if you'd like, and let them know that legally anyway, okay. uh, there's supposed to be a an opportunity for a collection due process hearing. I know, let's get all the laughs out now. Um, but they're not supposed to, they're, <laughs> legally they're supposed to give you the 30-day, you know, the, the final notice, and it's 30 days to request a collection due process hearing. So I let the employer know that there's no obligation whatsoever to comply with that. Let them see the actual law, and that we've been trying, you know, we've been trying to get this resolved with the IRS for a while. Um, if they're not going to stop, okay. I, even though I hate to do this, though it's, it has worked in mm-hmm. the, the few instances where we've had to do it, an emergency petition into the tax court to stop the levy because they did not give you the 30-day notice it has been sufficient to stop the levy right. on on the, the wages. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll set that up. I can send you an email back, and we can set that up. Um, I I think um, my company's headquarters is probably back east, so I might be able to do a before work thing like we've done with the uh, IRS, but we'll set that up. Sure, yeah. I, I, I know that the employers you know, are going to be very reluctant not to comply with that. Uh, but it's worth trying, and then this way we can put that in. If you have to do an emergency petition to the tax court, again, it's only to stop the levy because that's all they're going to do anyway. Uh, you'd put in there that you went to the employer. The employer is afraid of the IRS. They're not going to. Uh, they're going to comply out of fear, not because they believe that they're required mm-hmm. to do it or that the, the IRS is a good, wholesome, and you know, uh, all American type of institution. Right. You know, it's like the, the complying with the Boy Scout. Or that I have some kind of implicit contract or anything like that. It's I don't have any contract. I, anything that I've ever signed as far as IRS documents is under threat, arrest, and coercion. Everybody knows that. Sure. But not everybody acknowledges that it's not a contract, which is something I want to talk about today. You know, I just, I, and I guess it, that's just what happens yeah. is, you know, regardless of the mountain of evidence – to still use the word contract. And I don't think I'm splitting hairs there that, uh, that we're just getting hung up on a word. I mean, it's being used deliberately. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Uh, we're out of time for this segment. We'll be taking your uh, – appreciate the call, Kurt, so just hold on for a moment. My name's Mark Stevens. This is the No State okay. Project for December 21st, 2013, here on LRN.fm. And if you want to join the big show today, because we're finally back live – it's 218-632-9399, 218-632-9399. You can also reach me at on Skype at Frank Rizzo 3 Don't go away. We'll be back in just a moment. Yes, welcome back to the No Say Project. I'm your host, Mark Stevens. It's LRN.FM, the Liberty Radio Network, December 21st, 2013, live for the f- for first time in a few weeks, which I, I think they're like the first show for two thousand for, for December, I, I think it might have been. But I appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, if you want to uh, call the show, you may do so at two one eight six three two nine three nine nine two one eight six three two nine three nine nine. And um, we have uh, he hasn't been able to join us in a while because he actually has a life. But uh, JT is back with us. Welcome back, my friend. Well, thank you, Mark. Great, great to be here. Yeah, good to have you back. And I had mentioned earlier about yeah. uh, being up in Minneapolis and how cold it was. I don't know how you guys do it when it's yes. zero degrees. It's amazing what you get used to when you're born here, right? Oh, I, don't so. <laughs> I don't know. You, you I, I know, Kurt, it gets cold where you are, but not like uh, Minneapolis. Uh, I, I, no, no, no. The coldest it's got to this year was 15, and that 
that's the coldest that I can remember. So no, I mean, right now it's like 51 and it's been in the forties. It's just cold enough for me. I don't know. I think I'm getting old and it's just getting more susceptible to the cold. It's a bummer. Now, JT's the, the man among us because he, he deals with that uh, yeah. all the time. So, but uh, you told well, us the blood as you, uh, as you in warmer climbs. So, well, you know, if you, you, you can see the video that I'm doing now, I know you can't, but, uh, you know, it's the, the, the sun is just, no, it's, it, it, it's washing out half the video, but, uh, it, it yeah, it's it's partly cloudy, but it's still bright and sunny. I, I dare I say, for someone like yourself who is dealing with zero degrees, to come out here when it's 50, 55 degrees and sunny, like, yeah, you, you could probably get a, a, a nice 18 holes in. I'd be in shirts and a T-shirt at that temperature this time of year. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I got no doubt. Well, well, let's. Uh, Kurt had told us I didn't know. I f- forgot about this. Uh, so we'll do another segment with Kurt. In addition to the IRS, you have some local tax people that are uh, messing with you, and uh, and so uh, you you've got a traffic ticket that you're dealing with on. You said the twenty seventh. Yes. Yeah, it's a um, what do you call it? Um, photo radar. Oh, photo radar. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I like to do with those is to file a motion to dismiss for failure to enjoin an indispensable party. Now, I don't know if the rules have that in Oregon, but they, they have it. You know, here we're able to do it. And and I don't know who provides the equipment there in Oregon. A simple search would find out. But uh, Lockheed Martin would supply the ones, at least for a while, here in the Valley. So I would file a motion to dismiss for failure to enjoin an indispensable party, and I would name Lockheed Martin because they were getting like 48% of all the the money that was you know stolen from from the you know from the communities here in the valley and uh they didn't like that for some reason it really tended to upset these these uh, uh hearing officers these you know people with those stupid black robes on when you mentioned lockheed martin so uh you may want to find out who supplies the cameras wh- what the percentage is that they get and uh, bring that up okay i can do a search yeah i hadn't of course, I had filed a motion to dismiss, and I also filed a motion to dismiss for prosecutorial misconduct because we called them up, and um, they didn't give us any of the information we requested, no Brady information, you know, n- n- no evidence, nothing. Well, I would, I would nothing go— Nothing useful. I mean— Right. I would put out there uh, for those— new to the show that the Brady material has to do with evidence that the, that the prosecutor has that is— just shows your innocence that there's a lack of evidence for a particular element of the crime. It also has to do with if the witnesses, particularly the police officers, have a history of uh, dishonesty. And there may not actually be any Brady material right. regarding the dishonesty of the witness. There may not. It's possible. I know. I know. There may be actual mm-hmm. honest cops out there. I leave the door open for that. Uh, the prosecutorial misconduct, uh, do you think uh, – so when you go in on the 27th uh, – you know, the, the first thing, you, you, you're going to want to get to the motion to dismiss, right? Yeah, that's right. I'll bring that up and, and then see what they've got. Oh, well, they're not going to have anything. It's not like the Brady material where they may not, you know. If there's not, it doesn't make or break the, uh, the, the prosecutor's case. But if he doesn't have evidence to prove the Constitution laws apply, that does break it because he can't establish jurisdiction. He can't establish mm-hmm. an essential element of the crime. So I, I'm trying to remember what was what was the do you mind I mean you you probably remember the prosecutor's name do you mind giving that over the air? Um, let's see if I have it right here. Um, well, all we I think all I had I don't know if I had the prosecutor's name but I had the uh, the name of the person at the traffic desk. Yeah, well I have I'd have to look for it. I no, that's have no it right problem. Here my fingertips, but. That's no problem. No problem. So do you have any questions or concerns when you're going in on the 27th? And I think you said you had someone, uh, a friend of the show, uh, someone I've worked with before, that Danny may be able to show up as a media rep? Yeah, I'm going to remind him about that. Um, uh, Not so much questions. Maybe I should probably just um, get into the Skype chat and just practice a little bit just so I'm kind of confident. I think, you know, like you've mentioned before, the biggest – issue going in there is overcoming the fear, especially if you've never um, actually confronted these people before. Yeah. Now, JT, you can speak from personal experience. You know that, you know, we all have some Oh, absolutely. Of that. Yeah. It's, you, 
yeah. It, it, you know, once you go in and you've gone in a few times and, you know, the, the surroundings, the entrappings, and it looks like a church, and that's what it's meant to be. You're, and it's it's kind of uh, ironic that it resembles a church because they want you to worship and pray to them. But once you've been in there for a while and, and listen to these people, they're just people. They're just, regardless of the uniforms, they're just people. And in, in most cases, they're they're not the most competent people, and they're certainly not the most uh, honest people. So it, it, it becomes easier as you go in to digest that and overcome that uh, that fear. And Mark yeah. can Mark can speak to that as well. Yeah, I, you know, so Kurt, have you gone? Right. The, have you been? Well, yeah, you 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 weren't in court with the IRS, you know, but you I mean, you did confront an IRS agent. I would imagine that's just, that's probably that's more true. fearful than than going into traffic court. I think so. Um, I mean, the nice thing was I did have my girl, my girlfriend with me at the time. Um, and I wasn't the most eloquent, but, um, I wasn't like high strung or anything like that either, or really confrontational and spoke to him much as I'm speaking to you now. So I think I did okay. Yeah, we'll de- definitely get on well, the chat. Well, that's half the battle because that's disarming to them because they're expecting you to be emotional. Well, yeah, and, and they're definitely right. going to be pushing your buttons and want to and, and ramp up the stress for you because, as we already know, and I said so many times, that once they ramp up the stress and get you uh, emotional, the conscious, uh, the uh, the rational mind is, 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 you know, that is shut down, and you can't you can't think on your feet. Uh, but I would, yeah, I think going into the No Stay Project. Skype chat and setting up a room and doing some role playing. I think the guys like Keith and and Helen and, and Fabrice were doing and Vin Vin James of No Stay Project UK uh, had set up and were doing some role playing earlier. So definitely check that out. If you if you want, you can post on the forum and I'll get that an email where you're going to be so that other people in the area may be able to show up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll I'll go ahead and put it in there just in ca- case uh, there are other people in the area. Yeah, the, the the whole point, and again for those new to the show, the the reason why we do the media rep is so not it's so that because it is a very stressful situation to begin with, uh, and it doesn't mean you know not every judge starts screaming, but we we don't know that, but enough of them have done it, whether it's Canada yeah. or wherever we happen to be, uh, it's better to go in anticipating that and preparing for that. The media reps, as in general, uh, put the judge. And on better behavior, so it's easier to deal with the judge when he's not screaming. I mean, I think we can. I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. Right. I mean, I'm not. I don't think I'm breaking any, you know, real ground by saying that. Uh, but the media reps do help quite a bit. I know, you know, just from my own personal experience. And one thing I, one thing I did think about uh, saying is if the uh, judge did get really loud and start like really, literally screaming is. Sir, look, we're both adults here. You do not need to scream at me. You know, <laughs> I don't know if that, if we're, that would we're help, both, but I mean, come we're, on. Yeah, we're, we're up against a break, unfortunately. We're both adults here. Well, I appreciate the call. Just hold on a second. <laughs> We're both adults here. Well, we both look like adults. Now, the judge uh, is not really acting like an adult. It's true. They have uh, the five-year-olds in adult bodies, which is more technically accurate when it comes to judges. My name is Mark Stevens. You're listening to the No State Project. Join JT and I here at 218-632-9399. 218-632-9399. We'll be back in just a moment. Don't go away. Yes, welcome back to the No State Project. My name is Mark Stevens, author of Government Indicted which you can get at markstevens.net today. Uh, you're listening to the Liberty Radio Network, LRN.FM, for December 21st, 2013. Glad to be with you. And JT, it's good to... How long has it been since we did a show together? Far, far too long, my friend. Yeah, it's, it, it has, it's been a while. Hey, and maybe uh, near the end of the show, we can have Calvin jump back on, and uh, we could do a few segments there. That'd we be could, great. Uh, that would be really good. Be uh, you want to join us here on the show, it's 218-632-9399, 218-632-9399. You can also Skype me at Frank Rizzo 3 and I can put you into the No State Project chat. And that's Frank Rizzo with the number 3, Frank Rizzo 3. I want to go back to the calls. We have Stephen in California. Welcome back to the No State Project. Hey, how you doing? Great. What do you have for us today? Well, you know, you're talking about contract. It just happens to be something I want to talk about here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you always say the state laws don't apply and all that. So, 
here's what I got for you, Mark. Um, I'm still trying to fight that ticket where a cop said I was texting. I talked a few weeks back on that. Okay. And uh, so I just wanted to read you some of that I kind of learned recently about, you know, a couple of things there. First is whenever there's a constitutional law, you have uh, have to have three elements, I guess, to, you know, get that into to be a law. First is you have to have, um, you know, a valid contract. You have to have full disclosure. So, you know, like when they pass a bill in the House and Senate, they never read the bill. It's like 5,000 pages. But, you know, there's details in there. And then second is they have, you have to have val- valuable consideration. And to the exchange, and then third, you have to have an element which is the signature. You have to sign the damn thing, right? That's that's what you do when you make a law. Oh, well, I know it's a well, process of counting noses. I know, you know, I, I get that. But I, I, you know, it's it, as far as trying to say whether it's a valid law or not. I, I just don't see any merit in in doing something like that. I mean, okay. an, okay. an extreme. Well, let me, well let me, real quick, Steve, because an extreme, extreme case point. would be like with Bill Benson did. You remember that, JT, right? The law that never was, or something like that, where they were saying that the Sixteenth right. Amendment was improperly ratified, and blah, all that, and right. uh, you know, that it's just more effective. Whatever they're saying applies to you. Just ask for the evidence to prove that it does. That, to me, so regardless of how they're they're naming it, regardless of the process that went through to uh, be called a law or a, an ordinance or a bylaw, uh, that cuts through all that crap. Okay. Well, you know, what they have in California, and that's where I reside right now, it's uh, the California Vehicle Code. Okay. And what they, when you go to the DMV and get a license, basically, it's California Vehicle Code 17460, resident is accepting or retaining a driver's license. The acceptance or retention of a driver's license for the state of California, basically, issued pursuant to the provisions of the code shall constitute the consent of the person that shall, that service summons may be made upon within or without the state. That's a self-executing contract right there. And then also on 17460, any action brought in the courts of the state upon a cause of action arising in the in, uh, state out of his operation of a motor vehicle or anywhere in the state. That's a self-executing contract we're talking about. They don't explain that you don't have to have a driver's license. So now if you take the evidence, which they use the words person and cal- and they use the words vehicle, and, you know, then you go into the Cornell Law U.S. Code, Title 18, Part 1, Chapter 2, Section 31, they give you definitions under Number 6, motor vehicles. The term motor vehicle means every description of carriage or otherwise, you know, vehicle propelled by a human being and it's for commercial purposes. Yeah, but, okay, but so Stephen, Stephen, you, you, you can't... Commercial well, purposes, basically... Let yeah. me just jump in here, because what you're doing is you're trying to, you know, every statute or act or whatever they're called generally have their own definitions. And so what a, a very common right. fallacy that people do is they want to use a definition from one code uh, and, and then use it in another one. So here you've got the California Vehicle Code, and then you want to use a federal statute to say, well, this defines it this way, and that's well, what it must why mean. The federal work. Because in California Vehicle Code, Section 15210, in absence of federal definition, exemptions under this code apply. Federal definition applies. So you can use the federal code to apply for the California Code, because there is no definition necessarily any different from California versus the U.S. Code. And that's what I'm trying to say. It's more or less using their own system against them because you don't have to have a license. You have a right to travel. Matter of fact, even in the U.S. Supreme Court case, uh, I think it's Reno versus Congress, they said the same thing. The the the, the Supreme Court has said about the right to travel, but they've never held that the state right to travel, because state... In federal, they've never held that the state does not have 
the police under the police power to tax and regulate the roads and provide licenses. See, this is another confusion that people have. They take something like the Shuttleworth case where it says right. if the – let me just finish. If the state tries to license a federal right protected by the Constitution, then you can ignore it, it with impunity. That's not what's happening when you're talking about a driver's license. What they're trying to do is license what they believe is a state right that they have called a privilege – and the Supreme Court of the U.S. is not going to be friendly and say to you and say, well, you can't, you can't, you know, you can't tax the, uh, the, the, the state right to travel. They've already always held that they can, under the police power, tax and regulate any state right. They just can't tax and regulate a federal right unless there's some kind of precedent for that or some kind of exception in the law. Okay. I, I got what you're saying. But still, when it comes to the the definitions of state, the fe- in, in the absence of a state definition, the federal would apply. That's what uh, I'm that might that might it, it just depends on which federal definition is going to to govern. And I personally, I don't see the point of even getting into the definitions when there's no evidence whatsoever that the Constitution laws apply in the first place. So why even get into the minutia right. uh, of I this? Agree. Because <laughs> it, 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 what Larkin Rose proved through his ordeal that even when you go according to their own statutes, they don't care. So it's it's really a loser way to go. I don't mean Larkin's loser. It's just a losing way to go to try to use their code against them. It just it just tends not to work out too well, uh, at least not in the way that you and I or you know would be would be doing it. Well, and I don't. I wouldn't use it as a complete. Uh, this is all I have for defense. I would just throw this as an additional that the constitutional oh. law is going to apply. And here's why. And yeah, but so but what, what, what Mark is saying, though, why even go there when you don't have to? Well, I mean, it, dep- it, it would depend on how your your judge, I guess, would be in your case, which they call administrative, uh, you know, judge. Well, Stephen, the problem that I see with that is let's say you do that and you're really effective at showing that there's no evidence, but then you also bring in these legal issues, which you may be absolutely correct on. To me, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. If you have to appeal that and you appeal, you have the issues of fact, you know, where the the witness was not was incompetent and they deny cross. And then you bring up those issues of law. Right. What I've seen before, and no, this doesn't mean it happens every single time, but I have personally seen where people have done that, and what they do is they latch on to the issues of law that they could be responsive to and rule against you. And so, and then, then they don't even hear, they don't even hear the other issues. It's like it's an excuse not to hear exactly. the, the other substantive issues, which is why when you do an appeal, you don't yep. want to have more than three or four solid issues. That's you're like JT. You and I have been speaking a lot about this lately. The the uh, the Edwards case sure. again with the IRS. They never mentioned yes. the so-called frivolous arguments and the sophistry or sophistry that they claim that I put in that appeal. And I defy anyone right. to show me where a witness being declared incompetent by the judge is a frivolous argument to raise on appeal or sophistry because that's something the critics don't know. They don't know the actual issues that went into the appeal that the court, when they made the decision, those three judges, they don't know that they're ignoring the actual issues that were raised, that they're lying in their decision, which is a very common thing. Lawyers lying, even with robes. Who would have what thought? Right? What, what a, a shock. So just hold up there, uh, Steve. We'll finish off here. My yes, name is Mark yes. Stevens. Scorpion you, you can join uh, JT and I here on the big show. Looks like everything's going all right for now. <laughs> you can join us at 218-632-9399. 218-632-9399. Don't go away. We'll be back here on the No State Project in just a moment. Welcome back to the No State Project. This is the second hour of the December 21st, 2013 show here on LRN FM, LRN.FM. It is the Liberty Radio Network, and I'm glad to be with you here. And it looks like, uh, at least for today, we're going to be able to get through a smooth show. Uh, the, 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 the tech issues, uh, at least for the, show, the big show today, uh, I think we've got them taken care of. Something's just happened. And it was uh, the issue was my connection to the network last week, and uh, JT had the same problem today, but he's joining us on the caller line. Um, 
but it was just we spent hours working on it, Calvin and I, who, uh, of course, a big, always a big thank you to the work that he does behind the scenes. And, oh, and of course, when he joins us on the show, uh, getting the podcast done. But we worked for hours trying to figure out what it was. It was, a, it was crossing two computers, just like the Skype problem. And uh, we're across his operating systems. And um, I, I did a test on it during the week, and it was fine. The problem wasn't there. So, you know, give it a shot. And uh, so uh, we did a... Uh, the test this morning, everything was good to go, but unfortunately it affected JT, but we still were able to get JT on the caller line, which we were able to fix, uh, at least for the time being. So uh, I guess the, what I'm using now for the caller line, if you want to join me, it's at 2 and 8. I should know this by heart by now, but it's 2 and yeah, 8, 632, 9399. Oh, there he is. Hey, welcome back, tough guy. Thank you. I uh yeah two one eight six three two nine three nine nine and of course Skype is uh, get you into the Skype chat it's uh, Frank Rizzo three and we can uh, join there and um all right I, I, you know it's been two weeks so I have all this material all this stuff to talk about and uh, it's, it's like where do we start but I want to start with something here JT that has reared its head again and I guess every forum is going to get this and. Ah, the uh, forum at markstevens.net uh, is no exception. Now, I thought I went, up, you know, and I was very clear about this. Someone is on there, uh, at least a couple of people that are saying that the everything's a contract. And they quote this Patriot thing that's going, going around. I'm Patriot in a general sense. I don't know if it's Freeman on land or whatever. I don't, you know, to me, it's what's important is that they have these arguments and they, they, they put these things out and uh, there's almost no evidentiary support for it whatsoever and so the idea came up again someone had posted something in a I, I guess it could have been just to derail the thread and if so I helped derail the thread JT because I started engaging them in something right. that was off topic and I should have just as moderator should have just moved it but it's the idea that when you get a traffic ticket, they are offering a contract with you. So you just are supposed to write you know, certain words on there that you decline the offer to contract within three days. Three days, I don't even know where they're getting it from, JT. Where is the – you got to do it in three days. Well, so that's kind of the commerce, that's the commerce stuff where if you put it in an envelope and you send it back and it's, it's sent in an in a, in a anonymous third-party affidavit filing back that – you keep sending it back, and if you if you don't accept it, there's no contract. That's that's the theory anyway. But where does the three days come from? Where where is where is that from? What is the you know where was that? I've not heard. I don't know about that. I don't yeah, it, I knew people here in the valley that would have a big red stamp, bang, and they and they 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 just refuse for cause, uh, no without dishonor, and and uh, they said, oh, you got to do it within three days. Lunatics. Yeah, and um, thank you, thank you, and. Uh, so I, I just, you know, you try breaking this stuff down one line at a time to try to uh, see if any of it could be verified. And I've no, you know, I, I, all I get is, well, it's commerce. It's just like you said. That's what, well, it's, it, it's the, the affidavit rules commerce. I, 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 maybe I just don't know enough about this, but I just, no one is able to well, tell but, me. But so, so let's go, let's, let, let's get in the Wayback Machine and go to Mike's trial. Mike in Idaho, which we talk extensively about. Um, in talking to Alan, I know you, you're aware of this as well. They tried to throw up the uh, birth certificate as evidence of his uh, U.S. citizenship. Now I don't know if he did it, but that was a that was a, a, a shining example of where he could have gone. Well, how exactly is a form created before I'm barely a couple days old bind me to anything? Right. What evidence do you have? Uh, you just apply the trivium. Well, let's look at the evidence, sir. So you've got this person on the stand. Well, let's go through the six honest men. And for those who aren't aware, uh, uh, who, you know, who, what, where, when, okay? And then uh, you start asking why, and then you want them to explain how. So run me through it. Give me the evidence, you, you know, to show that the birth certificate, show me the who, what, where, why, uh, when, then give me the why, and then give me the how. And... He did not do that on the witness stand. Now, now, it wasn't all of Mike's fault, though, because he did have the psychopath Larry Burns who was threatening him at every step of the way, practically. Uh, the only time the judge wasn't really threatening him. I'm sorry? 
You always leverage a psycho judge. Always, 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 always. Especially in front of a jury. Always. Yes, you have to call him on it. You have to call him on. But he again, yeah. again, it was a very stressful situation. So, and I like Mike. Consider him a friend. I don't want to beat him up. Uh, but they they were pretty they, oh. they were pretty bad to him. But the three day thing just seems to be something that may be custom. Where it's assumed yeah. or it's shown somewhere two thousand years ago and beyond it. Three days is what you have to do if someone's trying to offer the contract with you. I, to me, I don't accept it because... I've also for 10 business days, too. Well, because like Lysander Spooner had Just, written... you know, throwing it out there. It, well, right. well, if someone is delivering a contract to you, and I know this is where we're going to get into some you know murky waters here, but bear with me. Like Lysander Spooner wrote in No Trees in the Constitution of No Authority. If something is in writing... The fact that you haven't signed it is evidence enough that there's no contract, even if they are trying to contract with you. The fact you haven't signed it. So whether you send it back in three days, is if you're talking strict commerce and the rules of contracts, the presumption is that if it is in writing and it is not signed it's pr- or and sealed, that, it, that the presumption is that whoever was offered the contract declined so i don't get the whole three-day thing i it just to me it it, it doesn't make any sense i, I no, just I don't get it. it the other side of it though jt and i don't know how many times we got to say this there is no voluntary support i don't care what i mean i did it with clint richardson we played the audio when i was on with clint a few weeks ago regarding harry reed and he was with jan heffield Heflin? Heffield? Heffield. Jen, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name, but it's Jen Heffield. We should have it linked on the website somewhere. You go to YouTube, you can check it out if you haven't heard. I played the whole audio where he was saying that paying taxes is voluntary. Now, we both have personal experience with this. I think we all do. Uh, Is there any evidence to show that you can not pay the taxes that the IRS claims you owe and they'll just leave you alone? No. no. They've got guns. They got How guns. About the guns? You know, the, the fact that it, not everyone goes to jail is not evidence that it's compulsory or not, or, you know, either way. The fact that they have threats and the fact that they do prosecute people and they have the open threat. The threat is right there in 7602, whatever the statute is. Mike was prosecuted under it. So the fact that it is a felony, you pay or you go to jail, that is evidence to me that these people are not doing business on a voluntary basis. I mean, can we agree to that? Is that an observable fact that we can – it's predictive and yes. we can replicate it? Would you agree with that? Yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, you and I have a mutual friend that yep. tested this. I don't – well, maybe test isn't the right yep. word. But it happened to him. and. Even without taking into account that he was sold down the river by a uh, a member of the bar, uh, he was attacked. I I met with the IRS agent. Yes. I knew he, it was it was not voluntary. Anyway, so if we know that they're not doing business on a voluntary basis, wouldn't that negate that they're trying that when they start to interact with you and they engage you that they're not looking to get you to uh, co- you know contract with them? Yes. I, I, to me, the issue is solved. I mean, it's right there, and I'm and I gotta tell you. So, so, well, are, are you? We're gonna have to hold that, Jake. Well, well, you're right. not gonna. All right, we're we're up against a break, so we're gonna have to finish this in uh, in all the right. next segment. Uh, well, we'll gonna continue talking about this. We've got a lot of ground to cover here. Uh, if you if you disagree, if you think that there is evidence it's a contract, despite the compulsory nature, two and eight six three two nine three nine nine is the number. We're we're live. And we could take calls, so uh, bring the evidence. I'd love to hear it. We'll discuss this some more in the next segment, so uh, don't go away. We'll, we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the No State Project. Uh, JT and I back here live together on the air for these uh, three hours of Anarchy Radio. Domestic terrorism, because we do not accept the concept of rulers. And if you don't accept the concept of rulers, well, then you must be with the Al-Qaeda. You're one of them dare terrorists. Uh, but if you don't believe in rulers... Unless and you're uh, subsidized you, by the CIA. I'm sorry? Sorry. Unless you're subsidized by the CIA. 
Yeah, unless you, <laughs> yeah. You said Al Qaeda, so it just depends. Depends who they're fighting. Yeah, the, the yeah, that's depends that's true. Depends which the wind's blowing. That's true. So uh, we're taking yeah. calls today. Two and eight six three two nine three nine nine. Two and eight six three two nine three nine nine. Nice to be back here live and actually taking calls. So I think we're. Def- I, th- I don't want to be too optimistic here, but I can't help it. I think we're going to get through a whole show without uh, without all the, uh, uh, the the tech issues. But uh, if someone has evidence that the police. Uh, the DEA or uh, people call government that when they uh, when they um, enter your life without your knowledge, without your consent, and they're doing things, uh, you know, you in a, using coercion against you. If you think that that is somehow commerce, and you believe that they're trying to contract with you, and you have evidence to prove that, man, you got to call the show. I, I no one. Just call the show. Show me where force equals contract. I love to see that. Now, I did get, JT, we're going to get into this in just a second. Um, I know I have a couple of things here. I am self, uh, uh, he's not going to be able to, he's saying that it comes from the 72-hour right to cancel and commercial transactions. Uh, I've also got Kevin here saying it's not under contract law with the UCC. Uh, even if we assume, JT, that, they're, you know, they're, uh, for sake of argument about the 72-hour right to cancel and commercial transactions, why would anybody classify or identify a traffic stop or the IRS or the DEA or, or the SEC? My gosh, the SEC. Why would anyone classify that or identify that as a commercial transaction? I, I, so, you know, one of the things that I, I – how is it commercial when they're using guns? That's like well, calling that's rape, con- you know, love. The side of the road, when someone hands you something to sign, and he says, sign this, or I'm going to haul you in, and he puts his hand on his, his sidearm, how is that a contract? Right. I mean, you go back to the Godfather. You have to. Right. Exactly. You know, in that scene with the, the wedding scene with the Godfather, we're talking about Luca Brasi. Right. My father said that either his signature. If you'd Luca Brasi, then, uh, then the, the the police the captain uh, that the that Michael finally offed. Yeah, I'd rather see Luca Brasi because he's only a guy. The the, the police captain he's, he wears a uniform. Of a bunch of guys are going to do the same thing to you. Yeah, but the the important the, the the important point here about this whole thing about being a contract is it it really comes down to like the Luca Brasi method where my father told him either his signature would be on the contract or his brains. That that's right. not that's not a commercial that's transaction. Yeah, that's no, that, it's not. It's not a commercial yeah. transaction when guns are involved like that. I, I, I just it no, it's a cri- it, yeah, it's it's yeah. Cri- it's, it's criminal. So I want you to get back to what uh, you were what we were oh. talking about right before we went to the break, JT. Right. I know you wrote it down. Oh, sorry. Um, geez, I gotta find it now. <laughs> a different yeah. type of tech <laughs> issue here on the No State Project. <laughs> Oh my! Um, no, uh, no. Let's. I, I. Okay, I got it right here. So let's go back to the the uh, the attorney relationship to to our mutual friend. So when he engaged an attorney, and and he talked to the attorney before he actually uh, retained him. The attorney admitted, like you and I, that there must be a valid cause of action. The all all the elements must apply, and it doesn't matter. Who it is? Right. He told me right? that. Remember that? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I have. It, I have soon, it. As soon as, yeah, as soon as, as soon as uh, his signature was on the retainer form and money exchanged, the attorney flipped like a light switch. Yep. No, no, we got to do what they tell us. We gotta, we gotta do what they tell. Well, what happened to the? Doesn't matter who it is. Well, this is different. Well, no, I actually I told you who it was and. Before I became your client, you agreed, but now that you got my cash and my signature on your retainer form, it's changed. We got to do what they say. Yeah, that was bad, and I and he knew so what I was talking you know, about. I would not have made the referral because I, of course, yeah, we both we both we both vetted him absolutely. Yeah, well, he, yeah, I I spoke to a, a few dozen attorneys. And none of them would take on, even though they agreed about the IRS, you know, the, about a valid cause of action, uh, because it involved the IRS, right. they didn't want to get involved. Nope, no mas. Gutless cowards. But this guy, this yes. lo- th- this attorney in, in uh, Minis- Minneapolis that did this to our mutual friend, now there was no, he, I have the notes, I have the, rec- I have that. 
I know what the man said, and I would never have made the recommendation. And everyone knows I've said it, you know, how many thousands of times? Three elements to a valid cause of action. Injury, damage, redressability. Yep. I mean, my gosh. I, I can, I can yep. say it forwards and backwards. I, I, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I vetted him fine. I, I investigated, and I asked him all the right questions, and he just yesed me to death. And uh, it was to the detriment sure. of a good man. Yeah, absolutely. But to get to this this issue of of it being a contract, there's I what I did on the forum was I said, look, where's the evidence it's an offer to contract? Especially since this particular poster has gone to jail on traffic. Okay, he claims he was using right. my method of asking questions. It's not my method, but if you go to jail because you've asked some questions. It's not because asking questions is a bad thing to do or not an effective thing. You're just dealing with crooks, and that happens, and it's happened to me too. Um, right. So I, I asked him, what evidence do you have to show that it is a contract? The only thing he came back with, JT, is from personal experience. I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't tell me anything. That's not an answer to the question. So the example that I used was I can say that I have deadlifted 450 pounds with just chalk. I can say that all day long. Right. Does that prove that I did it? No, it does not. No. So what I did was to make it easy, you know, maybe, you know, maybe I'm not explaining myself clear enough. And that's, I understand that. I get that. I, you know, I'm just some schmuck from Long Island. So I make it clear and I said, here is my claim. I deadlifted 450 pounds with just chalk. That's the claim. That's the opinion. The proof was I, I posted right. a YouTube video where I actually did it. So there was video proof of me doing it. So you could analyze it. Well, it could be fake weights. But the way the bar was bending right. kind of leads us to believe that this was real. So I, I, I said, just present us the evidence. And, of course, he didn't present any evidence. And he, he made something saying that uh, because it was thrown out, there was no evidence. That, no, that's not – that you don't – regardless of what the judge may have said of, and done, you don't need anything in court to show evidence that it's a contract. You have to be able to show the four elements. You have to show, you know, the, uh, an offer. You have to show a free, you know, meeting of the minds. You have to show uh, a, a valid consideration. And, of course, you have to have a freely given agreement. So uh, he didn't do any of that. So uh, that's why we have the show. Look, just, just get on the show. And, and demonstrate the evidence. Right. So, right. you know, I'm done. I, I'm done on the forum. I'm not even – and from now on, I, if those things come up, I'm going to start moderating this garbage, and I'm going to put it in its own little section, and, and if they've got the evidence, great. Then I, I will address it then. But I, I don't see that happening because the, the man had an opportunity to present the evidence, and you can't show that it's a contract when the gun is involved. And anyway, we'll be back with your calls at 218 632 9399 Welcome back to the No State Project. I'm Mark Stevens, author of Government Indicted. You're listening to us on LRN.FM, the Liberty Radio Network. It is December 21st, 2013 edition of the No State Project. And I, again, I, you know, I, I think the issue has been beaten to death. Uh, when a gun is involved, it's not commerce. That's ridiculous that, you know, uh, nope. even Al Capone it's, selling yeah. beer. Yeah. I'm sorry, JT? I said I think the word is theft you're looking for. Yeah, uh, and to think that, you know, like what was going on in Prohibition uh, with Al Capone and, you know, and, and whatnot, selling beer. His sale of beer, I wouldn't even consider that commerce uh, because you either bought his or you had your place blown up. So uh, unless right. you are using the word commerce to include – I think we have a delay. I'm sorry? Sorry about that. Sounds like the state. Yeah, yeah, but the thing is, if is if Al Capone, yeah, being here, hey. if uh, unless you're using the word commerce to include all human interaction for for whatever reason that it's just all human human relations, then it, it you it, you're absolutely it just I I what did Voltaire say? Before we can really engage, you know, I'm going to paraphrase, of course, we have to uh, define our terms. I don't use the word commerce in such a broad way. And the idea that it could be a contract when a gun is involved, no, no. And I'm not saying, JT, people have not done that and had tickets thrown out. Sure. Just like when I present something that could be independently verified, 
you know, the Socratic method, you know, the trivium. Uh, yeah, sometimes the judge sure. doesn't think there's any merit to it whatsoever and throws it out just because he doesn't want to deal with me that day. Not because it was he thought it was merit. The idea that a judge has to agree to something for something to be valid is ridiculous. That, that, that's as bad as, as, as the, you know, the, 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 the statist apologist. That, that, that's, show me where you have a contract when there's force involved, when a gun is involved. I want to see that. That's the, that's the issue. And, yeah, this poster had other issues I would have addressed, but he wouldn't address this one, JT, and just give me the evidence. So that's right. why we have ignore buttons. So I just I, I don't have the time uh, already to spend that much, you know, to spend too long on the forum anyway. And when someone's saying these things, I, 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 I'm out of my pay. I, I'm out of patience with that. I deal with people who can't be responsive every single day. And anyway, I want to get back to the calls. We have uh, area code uh, 708. You're live on the No Stay Project. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, this is Ken calling from uh, Aurora, Illinois. Illinois. Do you have uh, Ken? Uh, well, welcome to the you show. Do you have uh, Do you have evidence that a, uh, a, a that when a gun is involved, that there's a contract? Um, no. Well, that's obviously not a contract. That's coercion <laughs> okay. and uh, and force. That's BS. Um, the government has no valid points. They have no moral foothold. Um, but the purpose that I was calling you guys were referring to the um, the, the three days uh, for contracts earlier. So that I'm having, I don't know what I'm having trouble uh, understanding. He's talking about the three-day, uh, the seventy-two-hour contract uh, notion. Okay. Yeah. Um. I well, I believe it, it originated, as far as I know, um, with the the FDIC. Um. Whenever they got created, um, they had a couple of bylaws and stuff, and one of them was a three-day right of precision, um, in order to protect consumers, uh, so that they would be able to like take that contract. And verify it, and check with their own lawyers and sources and so forth before that before they you know fully commit to taking this money or or whatnot. Okay. Um, and like of course, if they did t- if they did receive the money, they would have to return it and so forth. And I believe there are um, certain states and certain municipalities that in you know different scenarios, the three day right of rescission is not valid, and other places have like a five day. But I believe that was where that's the origination of it. Okay. Um, if anybody else out there listening has a better idea, um, that's just what I pulled up from, you know, Googling it real quick once you guys start talking about it. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. So, like we mentioned before, if you're dealing with legitimate, you know, an actual contract where there's no gun involved, then the three-day rule comes into play. So, it, it's just it's, it's this broad definition that everything government does is contract or commerce, which... Uh, not when it's done with a gun. Not and I and I get that the 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 position where the the courts have ruled that if a government is engaged in commerce, then it descends to the level of an ordinary corporation, and there's no government immunity. I get that, but this is not what we're talking. We're not talking about them actually doing commerce. This is this is business at the barrel of well, a gun. I mean, the commerce clause, if that's what you're referring to, that gets so loosely interpreted, it's not even funny. I mean. That's basically how they tried forcing down Obamacare on us. Well, if you don't have insurance, then you're affecting the commerce, the you know interstate commerce by not buying it. So therefore, we have a right to say, hey, we regulate it. It's interstate commerce. You have to buy it. Um, no, are you kidding me? Well, I agree. I wasn't saying I wasn't drawing a reference to to the commerce clause, uh, but I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, here. Yeah. Yeah, they have used the, the interpretation of the Commerce Clause to apply to anything, even intrastate, where nothing ever leaves, because they say it could have an impact. I mean, it, the logic, if for lack of a better term, is so tortured, uh, nobody could really take these people seriously. Well, then again, JT, that's why they have guns, because nobody does take them seriously. Of course. Just in case things, yeah, uh, yeah in case you go to logic, but we got guns. Oh, okay, logic's gone now. Yep. Well, I, I, that's why I, in, in government indicted, I, I, I updated an old quote. Don't quote laws to us. Don't, don't ask for evidence. We carry guns. Right. I speak one <laughs> language. Coercion. Violence. Sadism. Right. That's, that's their credo. Yep. Fear. Absolutely, yep. That comes with the gun. That's, that's all they can do. That's all they have because they have no moral high ground they have no actual facts to back that up as uh our ex presidential uh what the heck was the name uh oh irrelevant um yeah they don't have any 
They have no moral high ground. All they have is violence. That's all government is, is a monopoly on force. Nothing more. And if you don't agree with that, well, then we'll stick you in a cage. And if you want to not go to your cage and you want to resist, we'll kill you. So That's what it comes down to. Right? Know. It actually came out on the forum yep. by the same poster that, uh, that we're all fools thinking that we're being forced, that there's no actual gun involved. And, you know, so I related a story that I haven't <laughs> mentioned in quite a while. I have the proof of this. I mean, I have the old reports I'll have to dig out of my garage. I was, in, I was pulled over by a Mesa PD. They blocked me in in a, in a Taco Bell parking lot. I refused to get out of the car. Uh, there was, uh, they, they called the fire department. And you said, well, why the hell did they do that? Because they threatened me. They said, if you do not get out of this car, we're going to smash the window and set it on fire. Do you, and they pointed, and they, they said, we're, de- we're serious. Get out of the car. When I saw well, that, that, makes, they, that makes sense. The PD, the, the the fire department was there then, anyway. Well, they didn't want any damage done, well, that, you know, to any of the other cars, and maybe to uh, maybe cause an inferno that would have affected the Taco Bell, which uh, you know would have been a problem. Right. Now, they may not. They may have still been bluffing, but they were so serious about me getting out of that car that they 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 had to ramp up the the threat and and make it look like yeah, we'll, we'll set the car on fire. This was a guy. A cop Mark, named... I honestly doubt they were bluffing. I mean, look at the Dorner case. They they were caught, you know, red-handed saying, "Burn the place down, kill him, oh. burn it down." Yeah, and nothing yeah. happened. I I wouldn't doubt that they would have. Yeah, well, they, they, well, at least it, with them, with Dorner, they had the uh, they they there was proof that he was armed, so they could you know, not that he was killing innocent people like the cops were, uh, but uh, as far as I know, uh, but yeah, here I was just I was just some schmuck from Long Island who was refusing to get out of his car. And it, well, mm-hmm. I, and I've done it before. We're here in Mesa, where I said, "Are you going to kill me if I don't get out of my the van?" They said, "Well, no." Then I'm not getting out, and I suggest you move your damn car. Well, they called someone who would. Right. Big guy, big six foot three, two hundred eighty pounds guy. He says, "Get out of the effing car, because I will kill you." Well, as long as we understand now that we're on the same page, uh, oh. if 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 this is under threat of death, then you 